Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that's in possession of the very last can of hoo hash. He is the captain. And the only way to smuggle this baby is up your hoo ha. It's good to be seen and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening and thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Anytime Minutes by the good people at the Willows Family Ales. Garage grade three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. This is a double IPA with an ABV of 8.5%, so watch yourself. This IPA is a great anywhere, anytime beer, thus the name. And Anytime Minutes was brought to us by all of these all-time greats. First up, we have Kate in Brooklyn, New York. And a big shout out to Patrice in Long Island, New York. Next to Southern Cheers to KC in Brock, Texas. And a big cheers mates to Danielle in Victoria, Australia. And a shout out to Catherine in Seattle. And a cheers to Emma in Miami. And last but not least, we have Laura in Amesbury, Massachusetts, who says... Keep on garaging. And if you'd like to fill up the garage fridge, just go to truecrimegarage.com and click on that donate banner. And thank you to all of you for your wonderful five-star reviews on iTunes. That's enough of the business, Captain. Everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. So, Captain, what happened to Gene Hart? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you all about it. Okay. Sit back and relax. Captain's taken over. The son of a bitch died. Yeah. (laughs) After his trial, he was immediately returned to prison to finish serving his 300-year sentence. Mm -hmm. On June 4th, 1980, while working out in the prison yard, he dropped dead at age 34. An autopsy states officially the cause of death was a massive heart attack. He had severely clogged arteries. Yeah, but isn't there some conspiracy that maybe he was drugged? Yeah, and we will get into that. But the autopsy states officially the cause of death was a massive heart attack. Uh, Hart's attorney, Garvin Isaacs, was quickly convinced that there was no foul play, saying, quote, his death was natural. He said that he looked into it himself. The medical examiner found 96 to 98% blockage in three of the arteries. Moreover, Isaac said Hart had a family history of heart problems. His, His brother died at age 38 of a heart attack, and his father also died at a young age of a heart condition. Right. Significantly, though, Hart's autopsy showed that indeed his vasectomy had failed. He was still producing sperm. Mm -hmm. After Hart's death, the doctor compared sperm taken from the murder autopsies with samples of Hart's sperm he earlier recovered from Hart's prison underwear. And he said that nothing he found changed the opinion that he had stated at the trial. Samples from Hart and from the bodies of the three girls revealed, quote, similar numbers of deformed or decomposed sperm. Right. And as you were mentioning conspiracy theories about Hart being killed, well, they were abundant. Mm-hmm. And the thoughts were that he was either killed by prison inmates or secretly by vengeful law enforcement. Right, which we hear this all the time. I mean, Hart's victims, if if he's responsible for these murders, the victims were kids. And mm-hmm. so there is, you know, kind of a, what do they call that, Pri- prison justice? Yes. That takes place. According to Dick Wilkerson, the former OSBI investigator who wrote the book Someone Cry for the Children, a large amount of cyanide was confiscated from prisoners at the McAllister State Prison the day before Hart died. Over 1,000 people attended Gene Hart's funeral, and no one else was ever charged with the Girl Scout murders. No one else being ever charged, but we have a list of other suspects we need to go through. Yeah, the guilt or innocence of Gene Hart is still one of the most hotly debated topics in Oklahoma legal circles today. But if Gene Hart didn't do it, who did? So Camp Scott officials reported seeing strange men around the camp in the days before the murders. Ben Woodward saw some men near a stream running through the camp. 
And on the night of the murder, Barbara and Richard Day left the camp to buy milk around 7.30 p.m. Yeah. They later reported seeing a car parked with four occupants right outside the gates to the camp. The possibilities of others seem endless, unless you think about the familiarity Killer would have had to have had with the layout of Camp Scott. Then even those that believed that Gene Hart was the killer questioned if Hart could have done it by himself. Did he act alone? Yeah, well, you have three victims. And this is what makes it difficult. Because how could one person subdue all three little victims at once and then three killed and carried some distance away, all with barely making a sound? Right. Plus, we also have the multiple shoe prints that were found. Supporters of this theory also cite the widely held belief that the hands of two of the slain girls were bound using different knots, which is debatable. The medical examiner cited only a double half hitch in the cords around the necks of Michelle and Denise, while someone else described a slip knot. Perhaps the knot disparity, if it exists at all, comes from the fact that Denise and Michelle were tied up in a very different manner. So let's get into some of these different and some of these possible suspects, Captain. We have Bill Stevens, William A. Stevens, who was 22 at the time of the murders. He became a key figure at the murder trial of Gene Hart. He was the man whom Garvin Isaacs pointed out as the actual murderer of the three girls. At the trial, Joyce Payne and her son testified for the defense that Stevens came to their home the day the Girl Scouts were killed with scratches on his arms and red stains on his boots. They also linked the red flashlight found at the murder scene to Stevens, saying it was theirs and Stevens borrowed it. Right, which would make sense because if Hart stole anything from the farmer, the farmer is not convinced that that flashlight came from him. Right. And the woman's boyfriend, Dwayne Peters, told Oklahoma authorities that Stevens once claimed to have killed the girls while having war game hallucinations. He said he surveilled Camp Scott just like Vietnam and picked out the most isolated tent. So when he was fi- fighting uh, Charlie... Back in the day, did he also rape Charlie? I I during, cannot. <laughs> during his war games? I cannot mm-hmm. attest to that. But Peter said that Stevens told him this while the two were driving around the area in October of 1977, even demonstrating how he covered one of the girl's mouths with his hand. Peter said he refused to believe Stevens, thinking he was bluffing, until he saw him abduct a woman, beat, and rape her. This was indeed the crime for which Stevens and Peter's were later incarcerated in Kansas. Only Stevens raped the woman. The woman was left to die in her car trunk, but survived. She identified Stevens and Peters. In addition, a young Girl Scout, Kimberly Lewis, testified that she saw a man who looked like Stevens at the camp the night of the murders. Needless to say, this eyewitness ID by a young girl of someone seen in an instant in pitch black night was and is suspect. A further problem for the Hart defense was Stevens maintained he was working in Seminole the day the girls were killed at Camp Scott. Stevens' employers confirmed his story with a canceled paycheck and a time card. Furthermore, at the Hart trial, forensic chemist Ann Reed said hair found from one of the victims and in the dead girl's tent didn't match samples of Stevens' hair. Peters eventually recanted his tale of Stevens' confession and said his girlfriend, Joyce Payne, fed him bits and pieces of information from the news about the case, so his story linking Stevens to the crime would sound more credible. Their plan was for Peters to get paroled, or at least transferred to Oklahoma as a reward for providing information on his fellow inmate. Joyce Payne and her son, Larry Short, were charged with perjury. She pled no contest to a reduced misdemeanor charge, it was sentenced in early 1981 to a suspended six-month term. The charge against her son was dismissed. Bill Stevens was stabbed to death in his cell at the Kansas State Penitentiary in Lansing in 1984 at the age of 27. So maybe it's possible that he's a little off his rocker because of war, and maybe by being so that causes death in prison if that makes any sense. Another suspect whose name was circulated was convicted child rapist and murderer Carl Lee Myers. In his murder trial, the state presented evidence of Myers' convictions 
of assault with intent to rape a 12-year-old girl in 1976, for which he received 20 years. Two sexual assaults in 1981 against a 13-year-old relative, and a 1990 conviction in Rogers County for murder of Cindy Marzano. John Russell, an ex-convict who professed to be making a film about the Girl Scout case, said the late Myers confessed to him about the Girl Scout murders once they were sharing adjacent cells. Russell gave the information to OSBI, which would say only that the agents checked out the lead. Myers died in 2013 of natural causes while awaiting execution for the 1996 killing of Marzano. There is no evidence linking him to these crimes. Right, and we have DNA evidence, right? They collected the evidence. They still have it, so we can test it? Mm, Not exactly. Then we have a truck driver from West Memphis, Arkansas, name unknown. He testified at the trial that he was questioned five times about his whereabouts that night. Other than this statement from the trial... We have nothing other than this linking him as a suspect. Yeah, but I'd like to know more about this individual because you're claiming that possibly he's responsible for the death of three children, roughly the age of, well, age 8, 9, and 10. And then in the West Memphis 3 case, we have three victims, all of the same age of 8, all three bound. Mm -hmm. It's just very similar I mean, I know it's, you know, a decade apart, Mm -hmm. but it's also you got a truck driver and the crime in West Memphis happened right by a car wash, which had truck washing capabilities. Right. So it's kind of interesting there. John Clayton Potts. This is a cousin of Gene Hart, who was 21 at the time of the Girl Scout murders. He was arrested in 1979 for the repeated rape of a 13 year old girl who was also his cousin. He lived near Camp Scott and was questioned at the time of the murders, but ruled out as a suspect, according to the OSBI's Tim Lemke. What's interesting is this quote from Sheriff Weaver. Potts identified mugshots of Hart and had Hart at the scene within a matter of hours of the time of the murders that w- when they were committed. Weaver has never explained exactly what information Potts gave them about, about Hart. Many believe that Potts was the informant whose information led to Hart's arrest at the shack. Ricky Green was in prison in New Mexico for burglary, but escaped and was found in Oklahoma. Green confessed to the killings, telling OSBI agent Jack Lay that he and two other men were high on drugs when they committed the crimes. Green was ruled out as a suspect because he failed five polygraph tests. So let's talk about these last two individuals. So John Clayton Potts, who was the cousin of Gene Hart. Right. He's 21 at the time of the murders. He's arrested in 79 for raping a young girl. So he has similar tendencies to what we would expect from our suspect. The interesting thing about him is how does he get on this list? Well, one, we know that he was involved in the investigation early on. Because we have that interesting quote from Sheriff Weaver saying Potts identified mugshots of Hart and could place Hart within the scene of the crime within a matter of hours uh, from the time of the murders, around the time of the murders that they were committed. What's, What's interesting about John Clayton Potts is we know he's an associate of Gene Hart. He's his cousin, and he claims to have seen Gene Hart within hours of the murders. So he can be a suspect on this list for several reasons. One, he puts himself within the area around the time of the murders. And two, he puts himself with Gene Hart, yes. possibly with Gene Hart shortly after the murders. So, And a lot of people would think it's more likely that there was two perpetrators in this crime. Yeah, so you have John Clayton Potts who, who fits into a unique category as a suspect. Either he did it himself or he could be an accomplice of Gene Hart's. And you would think, though, we got this fingerprint on the flashlight doesn't match him because we know it doesn't match Hart. Mm -hmm. And regarding this Ricky Green, the guy that was in prison in New Mexico for burglary, Uh the guy that he he confessed to the killings. Mean Green. he, He tells the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigations that he committed the crimes. He and two other men committed the crimes. 
And we say that he was ruled out as a suspect simply because he failed five polygraph tests. I have to believe that there's more going on with this. I don't feel like they would rule this guy out immediately. We do know that OSBI publicly stated they thought that Hart was their guy. So you and I know from our long time of doing this that sometimes they don't really, they're not fully investigating these things after they think that their guy's already been, you know, he, by this point he's dead. Hart well, is dead. and also the tunnel vision for one, and also just, I mean, we see it all the time with, whether it's uh, an author or just an armchair detective that creates a theory and it rules out any other possibilities, no matter what is presented to him, no matter what evidence is presented to him. But I think there's more going on here with the, you, you fail five polygraph tests and you're probably changing the story so much that maybe law enforcement doesn't even know what to believe. I agree with that. And that's what I think we have here. But that's a sticky situation too, because within the bits of his confession, he states that he was high on drugs when they committed the murders. So yeah, but we've seen that too. I mean, uh, what's, what's he going to remember or how, what will be his memories that he has of those events? Well, we've also had people that have confessed to crimes and, um, had other people involved saying, Hey, this person helped me with the crime while they're on drugs. And I think believed it for so long. Um, but it could be as simple as, you know, they were high on drugs and saw a news report about this. And you have to wonder, too, when this confession was delivered to OSBI, because what available evidence did they have at the time of this confession? Because if they still have a lot of evidence on hand, regardless of if you believe his story or his story doesn't add up, you know, you could chalk that up to him being high on drugs. You can test this evidence, you can look at the evidence, and you can compare it to him and the other two people, that individuals that he named as accomplices. Right. And maybe you're able to clear those other two at the very least. It's That's a curious story right there. I would like to know more about this Ricky Green confession, and I hope that there was more to rule him out than just the failed polygraph test. Now, here's some other angles here, Captain. So there's one theory that the counselors or some of the counselors in some way or form were involved in this. So a few pieces of information led people to speculate that someone at Camp Scott pulled off an inside job. One was the confusion early on about whether the three victims were actually raped or just sexually assaulted. The DA refused to say that the girls were raped. And we now know that there were differing conclusions about the presence of semen or sperm. Right. Which led people to suspect that maybe a woman could have been involved. Also, well, we have the small shoe print as well. Yes. The tennis shoe print that was found is smaller in size, more like a female. The camp dog. This is this is an interesting tidbit here. Okay. No one reported there was a camp dog. Okay. That, that lived there that What's occupied the, the camp. I, I had that somewhere, but I don't have it with me today. Of course not. Such a disappointment. Well, the camp dog, no one reported hearing the camp dog bark that night. We have all these other reports of strange noises and going on in the in the woods. Right. But nobody reporting this dog alerting them to anyone being nearby. So maybe was this dog, was she familiar with the perpetrator? Mm -hmm. and yeah, but even if, you're, even if a dog is familiar with you, chances are if you're in the woods in the dark, you're still going to get the, the dog to start barking. We also have the fact that it's very likely that the killer had some, might've been intimately familiar with the camp itself. Mm -hmm. And the one tent out of all the tents that were there, the one tent that the killer or killers chose was the only tent that had only three occupants. Also, we have a towel used in the counselor's tent to wipe their feet on that rainy night that had been hanging on the end of Carla's bed at bedtime was found by investigators on the 13th with blood on it. It appeared to have been used to wipe some, some blood up at some point. Right. The 2007 DNA testing showed that the pillowcase sample was likely from a woman, but it didn't rule out. This is the problem with this. It didn't rule out that it had belonged or came from one of the victims themselves. Right. Then we have the story of the minister. In 1990, 
Tulsa World ran a very detailed article containing the following information. An Oklahoma minister, Reverend Gerald Manley, claimed he can name two of four men he says participated in the Girl Scout murders 13 years earlier. Ted Lay Turner, a former private investigator who assisted officials in investigating the slayings, believed Manley pushed for a grand jury to be convened to examine Manley's claims. Turner said Manley claimed to have been in the tent the night of the murders, along with some young men he didn't know, but he met when Manley was driving and ran out of gas. These young men drove up to help him. Manley claimed one of the men led him to a tent in the Girl Scout camp. Inside the tent, Manley claimed he saw one of the dead girls lying on the floor and two zipped up sleeping bags that appeared to contain bodies. According to the OSBI spokesman, when the story was brought to the OSBI, agents were assigned and laboratory tests were performed on a plastic glove that Manley got from one of the men he accused. The glove had what appeared to be blood on it. The OSBI submitted a report to the DA, but as far as OSBI was concerned, there was nothing to warrant further investigation. The man who headed the investigation for the OSBI in 1977, Ted Lemke, said he remembered when Manley brought the story forward years ago and said there was nothing to substantiate it. He did also say that the OSBI never denied the fact that more than one person could have been involved. Harold Barry, who was the first trooper on the scene at Camp Scott and who went on to become Mays County Sheriff at one point, said he met Laterner and Manley at a restaurant in 1990, and Barry asked Manley to draw a diagram of the camp layout in the victim's tent. Yeah. He couldn't draw a layout of the camp. He couldn't draw a layout of their tent. And then Barry said that's when he leaned across the table and asked the man, what will you do if I arrest you right here for being accessory to the homicides of the Girl Scouts? Barry said the man replied, well, maybe I just dreamed I was there. So strange that it seems like there's so many people that want to take credit for this or p- point the finger at somebody. And we've seen this at other times, too. We're talking about... It's always well, the popular cases in the yeah, community. Yeah, most likely the most infamous case in Oklahoma history, you know, as mm-hmm. far as, you know, 1970s goes. And so we have all these people coming forward that have some involvement. Either they did it or they know who did. Yeah. This story comes from claims online. Okay. So there's a camp called Camp Garland. This was a Boy Scout camp and it was located about a quarter mile away through the dense woods from Camp Scott. Right. Now much has been made of a story circulating online that claims that a scout at Camp Garland witnessed three Boy Scouts returned to camp in the middle of the night, all bloody, and they're claiming they killed some girls. Yeah. Nothing has ever come of this story. Personally, I think investigators would likely have been able to find some evidence left by a bunch of young teenage boys right? who were, well, who are unlikely to have navigated their way through the pitch black forest area between the camps in the middle of the night to assault, molest, and kill three young girls. Yeah, but you got Boy Scout camp. You have Girl Scout camp. It makes like a great urban legend story. It does, but they pop out of, let's say say this. Let's go through this a bit. Uh-huh. They, they pop out of the woods, and uh-huh. they tell this individual, we just killed some girls. How, if that's true, this was 1977. Since then, how many other people would they have told along the way? One. And then two, what about all that stuff that was found in those caves that were you can trace back to the murder scene? Possible planted evidence. Right. And for you to believe this theory, you have to believe all of that evidence was planted. Right. Yeah. But but also maybe that uh flashlight was not Hart's flashlight. Maybe that was somebody else's flashlight, one of the Boy Scouts. And we don't know who these Boy Scouts are, quote unquote. So maybe maybe a couple of them committed suicide. We don't know. Mm-hmm. But it, it does make a, a good urban legend story.
All right, we're back. Cheers, me matey. Cheers to you, Captain. Well, all these theories and all these other suspects that we just discussed, what mm. that tells me is even though this case is old, it's unsolved, and let's go ahead and label it cold. It's a cold case. Right. It tells me that the people, the public, they've not forgotten. No. They've not given up that there is somebody out there responsible for this, and it could be Gene Hart, who we already discussed. Right. Now, one thing that we did talk about, too, was that it seems on the outside looking in the OSBI and other agencies close to the case, they've said some public statements and done some things that cause you or cause one to believe that maybe the case is closed in their mind and they weren't or were not actively working the case in the years to come. However, there were other agencies that were doing some work on this case. Yeah, we see this time and time again, though, where somebody says, hey, look, we, we, we think we know who is responsible. We tried them, and it didn't work out in our favor, but we think we know who's responsible. And the reason that we know that other agencies and other people still cared about this case, and again, I want to be clear, I'm not completely saying that OSBI didn't care and quit caring. I'm not saying that local agencies quit caring and quit working the case. I'm just saying there are things that were statements made publicly that could lead one to believe that. But over the years, what we have seen is several groups and organizations and agencies who kept running tests on the evidence that was found at the murder scene. Sometimes they're testing this against possible suspects. So we do know that people out there do care. Agencies do care and they continue to work the case. Yeah, because this family needs some kind of conclusion. There's been many of these tests conducted over the years, and I won't go through all of them because it's it's some pretty heavy lifting because they kept testing and testing and testing this stuff. But I do want to talk about and cite some uh, some of these tests. So there were tests run in 1989. This showed that three of the five DNA traits found in the samples taken from the dead girls matched that to heart. Right. Authorities emphasized that only one in 7,700 American Indians would match the samples of fluids to this extent. Hart did. But because only three of the five aspects matched, the results were officially deemed inconclusive. Jack Graves, then Mays County District Attorney, said if that test result had been available back then, he would have used it at the trial. Yeah. He said, what it comes down to is this. If there were 7,700 North American Indians at the Girl Scout camp that night, on the night that the girls were murdered, only one would have matched the gene characteristics in the evidence left there. And again, Gene Leroy Hart matches this. Right, that's pretty damning evidence. That's what he says. He says the chances of that are pretty small. No, that that's what he said. Yeah. In yeah. other words, the best statistical chance that the state could cite that Gene Hart was the killer was one in 7,700. In 2007, the OSBI received a federal grant to have DNA evidence in unsolved cases examined by private laboratories using DNA testing not available at OSBI. In May of 2007, the lab issued a report that no DNA results were obtained from this evidence in this case. Most likely what that leads us to believe is that these samples since have deteriorated and we've lost the ability to test, yeah. to test them. So where that leaves us, Captain, is an unsolved case where we do have a lot of circumstantial evidence and I would argue a lot of physical evidence that does link what can only be described as the prime suspect. Hart, yeah. Gene Hart. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult, too, because, again, you want to get some kind of answers for the victim's families so that maybe they could have, uh, I, again, we've talked about this before. People say, well, maybe they get closure. Well, I don't know if they ever get closure, but maybe they get some answers. In this case, it's really, it's so blurry because I think the evidence points to Hart. I don't know if that points to Hart being acting alone or mm -hmm. with somebody, mm -hmm. but it definitely points to him. But again, if you're on the jury and you know that he's going to get 300 plus years in prison anyways, it's hard to rule in his favor or her, or against him. 
it seems to me, and again, there are differing reports of this. So it's, it's hard to say 100% what actually happened that night and who committed these murders. Yeah. The evidence leans and toward and points toward the fact that there may have only been one killer as almost impossible as that may seem. The DNA evidence would suggest that there was only one rapist. Right. So if we had to pick just one guy, one guy acting alone, the, the problem with Gene Hart is several things. You can't rule him out using DNA. You just can't. He's, he's the one in 7,700 people that matches what evidence was found there. Right. And those other statements about him being a secretor and being a typo blood and having deformed sperm, that the numbers back then, and I can't, I can't back up the math on it, Right. But their statements were it was 0.002% of the American population. That's a very small number. And on top of that, we know that he was close to the area. He was active in burglarizing the area. Right. He also had his mother's home, you know, uh, well, half a mile or so from, from the crime scene. Yeah. And he's his childhood home was he's on the run from the police in the first place. My other thing, too, is I really question. You know, the, the problem with heart for me is really the fingerprints. No fingerprints. You, you break into a house. You steal a flashlight. You're wearing gloves at the time. You just always wear those gloves anytime you're touching this stuff. It's not that hard to think that there wouldn't be fingerprints if he's wearing gloves. Well, and he's somebody that I would categorize as a career criminal. You know, at a very young age, he yeah. he raped those women. And let's... Who who cares, man? If anybody wants to argue this with us here in the garage, what what we can see by that first offense, it was a terribly violent offense. Right. He raped these two women. He abducted them, raped them, and it left them to left death. them for dead. Yeah, yeah. The way that he tied them up, the way that he kind of he almost concealed their bodies in a way. It would have been two rape charges and two murder charges, and he pled guilty. Mm-hmm. So he wasn't claiming he was innocent. Yeah. And there are people out there back in 77 that thought, hey, this guy got railroaded the first time. Right. How can you get railroaded when you plead guilty? Right. And maybe, you know, maybe Hart would tell you, well, they they were stacking the case against me, this, right. that, and the other thing. These women were tied up and they were bound in a manner that they would cause their own deaths if they came to and struggled to free themselves. Right. He intended for them never to be found. He intended them to me never be found alive. Yeah, because he's real busy. And when he went to prison for that, Mm -hmm. I think that like these other career criminals do, whether it be, whether your crime be theft or, you know, holdups or rape or murder. Right. All of these individuals, they tend to learn from their past mistakes. And I think what you pointed out is spot on. I think it's as simple as he was using gloves during the, perpetration of burglarizing homes. Yeah. And therefore, regardless of his state of mind or regardless of his condition, he was using gloves at the time of the murders. And he likely all those items that he brought with him to the scene show to me that he probably carried them under gloved hands. Yeah. The other thing too, is we saw things in his first rapes of those women, of the pregnant women. We saw that he premeditated that attack. He brought with him to the scene things that would help him bind these women up. He laid out newspapers in the trunk of his car so that if there was any evidence that would be left behind, probably to sop up blood if it, if need be, to catch the blood that he could later throw those newspapers away. Well, and he wasn't going to take any chance of leaving any victim alive. Mm-hmm. There's going to be no possibility of that. And I think what we see here with the Girl Scout murders is the same thing. I see a perpetrator or perpetrators that brought to the scene with them instruments that would help them commit this crime. Right. Binding. I think the intent was not to go there that night and steal things from the camp. I think the intent was to show up there and do something very bad and very horrible. Yeah, no, I agree that the tricky thing to me, though, is. There's so many things that are done to tents, and there's so many people that, oh, we think we saw a guy come into our tent. Our tent flaps were messed with. 
this stuff was stolen. You have three victims. It almost seems either again like a shapeshifter. I'm not saying he he actually can shapeshift, right. but somebody that is very familiar with the tent, they're in a semicircle. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be that hard to cause all that commotion, but with the three victims, you know, it makes me believe that possibly there was somebody else with him. Yeah. The the thing though, he is very experienced outdoors. He knew the area better than most, arguably better than anyone. Anybody at that campsite. Yeah. I mean, it, it, by all accounts, it seems like he was mostly living off the land in the area at the time. I think this guy would have had the stealth ability of creeping up on those campers to those different tents, and he would make a lot less noise than most of us would do. The other thing, too, is regarding some of the items that I believe he brought with him that night, the flashlight. So it's often discussed, and this is rightfully so, but many people point out that the newspaper inside the flashlight was most likely to keep the battery forced up into position so it would provide power for the light itself. Yeah. I agree with that 100%. I think that that was one of the reasons for the newspaper inside the flashlight. But I also believe that it was jammed up in there so that the battery wouldn't rattle around in the flashlight so that the person could sneak around making less noise. Yeah, makes sense because you alter the front lens so it's a smaller flash. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you alter the battery so it doesn't rattle. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and you've used those size of flashlights before. They can they can make little rattling noises. Yeah. I, I personally don't use them that size. I like to use the big mag ones mm-hmm. that you could beat somebody over the head with like a baseball bat. But if somebody was, let's say, clever enough to alter the lens of the light, to mute the light, and only have that little bit showing through... Mm-hmm they're coming up with other ideas as well. And I don't know, man, the, the, the troubling thing is I agree with you. Some of the items that were found, some of the evidence that was found that does link heart to the murders. It's sketchy. If it was planted or not, they had it out for heart period. And I have a hard time believing though, that all of the evidence itself, right? But it's, it's okay. Remember how they said, Oh, it was like we're reliving the OJ trial, Mm -hmm. but it's the same thing. It's like just if they planted evidence, right? I I can, I can back up and say, maybe they did plant some evidence. Maybe they didn't like OJ and they planted some evidence and they want to get a hard conviction. Okay. Maybe they planted some evidence, but they didn't plan it all. Right. And there's a possibility that you can be guilty and the police did plant evidence. Mm -hmm. We live in a world that that's possible. I think if Hart did it, he took the murder weapon with him. Could have been the flashlight. May not have been. I don't think that that, uh, you know, we have that crowbar or that tool that was missing from the nearby farm. Uh I don't know 100% that it came from the farm or that it was used in the murders. I kind of feel like that, that whoever, if all those items found in the caves, if they weren't planted, I think that the killer took enough of the stuff with them or right. with him that he wasn't just leaving random things behind. Maybe I'll tell those, you what, they didn't plant that pile of human poo-poo. And maybe those uh, PBR bottles, the, the beer bottles, that was just him sipping beer while he lie in wait, while he waited for the sun to go down, watching the campers, seeing who goes into what tent, seeing where they are proximity to the counselors. Right. The tricky thing, too, is I think Hart had a hell of a defense team. You know, we, the community that believed he was innocent pulled together, raised a bunch of money, and hired what I think was a good defense team. They right. pulled out tactics similar to what we saw with the Casey Anthony case, with the O.J. Simpson case, where we have a defense team that basically states, look, look at all these other possible theories and suspects that you can't rule out, jury. They even had people testify saying, yeah, I was questioned about this five times. Right but there's no real evidence. And they even presented other possible suspects. You can't rule them out jury. Oh yeah. And the possibility of they planted evidence on this as well. And they can't say 100% that the DNA evidence left matches heart. 
And so I think the situation there is difficult for the jury. I think that it was a clever chess move by the defense team to conveniently let it slip out that this guy's already serving 300 years in prison. And I know we have the statements by some of the jury that say, look, we didn't feel like the state put up enough evidence against this guy. I think what it boils down to is if you're sitting there in that chair questioning the guilt or innocence of this dude, right? it's easier for you to go, you know what? He's innocent, but he's not going to walk free anyway. He's going to spend the rest of his days in prison. And on top of that, if you do say he's guilty and you got it wrong, then, then you got it wrong. If, if you say he's innocent, it's almost like you can't get it wrong. And so I think with the, what the jury was burdened with was a heavy hand was, it was a, was a heavy task. I think here in the garage, we're, we're not burdened with such a heavy task. We don't have to say beyond a reasonable doubt. I think for me, I'm anyway, definitely burdened though. <laughs> I'm burdened in ways that I can't right. discuss here, Yeah, but it's I not in my contract. I feel very confident in a couple of statements. Okay. One, I think this is a cold case. I think it may remain a cold case, unfortunately, but I also feel like that if I had to pick one person, Hart's the guy. Uh I think Hart's the guy. I will say this though, uh, to leave a bit of optimism out there. I have been in contact with people in the last few months that have said, no, Nick, it's not a cold case. Wait for it. There's something that's coming in this case. Well, let's end 2018 on a good note, a high note with some good recommended reading. Yeah, check out our recommended page at truecrimegarage.com. We'll have this listed there for you. This week, we are recommending Alcatraz, The Last Survivors. Nine former inmates reveal secrets of The Rock. And the author, John Forsling, he is a lifelong Alcatraz buff, and he interviewed Nine different inmates, including Whitey Bulger and also suspected serial killer Harve the Hammer Carnigan for this book, where they give detailed accounts of some of their crimes and their times at Alcatraz. And again, everything that we recommended this year is on the recommended page on our website, truecrimegarage.com. And if you go to truecrimegarage.com, you can also click on Off the Record. It's our bonus show that's on Stitcher Premium or download the Stitcher app for all of our old episodes, it's free. Yeah, we've done over 260 episodes now, so if you want to find the old and good ones, go back and get the Stitcher app. And we will not be recording or in the garage next week because it is Christmas, so I want to wish everybody a happy uh, holidays, safe travels, happy new year, and uh, we'll see you in 2019. And here's a new year's resolution for us all. Let's be good, let's be kind, and don't litter.